Episode of Progress, Potential, and Possibilities, discussions with fascinating people designing a better tomorrow for all of us. I'm your host, Ira Pastor. Welcome, everybody, again to another episode of our show, bringing you another really fascinating guest today, uh, helping to create a better tomorrow on many unique fronts. Uh, today, we have the honor of being joined by Dr. Felicia Goodrum, who is uh, Interim Associate Department Head, Professor, and Director of the Graduate Program uh, in Immunobiology, uh, as well as Professor of the Bio5 Institute, uh, Cellular and Molecular Medicine, Molecular and Cellular Biology, and Cancer Biology Genetics Graduate Interdisciplinary, Interdisciplinary Programs, University of Arizona. Uh, Dr. Goodrum earned her PhD uh, at Wake Forest University School of Medicine, where uh, she was involved in studying cell cycle restrictions to adenovirus replication. And then she did postdoc work at Princeton uh, in the laboratory of Dr. Thomas Shank, studying um, human cytomegalovirus latency, which we'll be talking a lot about today. Uh, Dr. Goodrum joined the faculty at University of Arizona back in 2006, and her longstanding uh, research focus is ultimately to understand uh, the really interesting molecular virus host interactions important to, to human CMV latency and persistence in the host. Uh, she has focused uh, during this time on identifying uh, both viral and host determinants that mediate the switch between latency and replicative states. Uh, ultimately, the goal of her research program is to, to further define the, the mechanistic underpinnings of this latency and reactivation to ultimately lay the foundation for different clinical interventions uh, to control uh, CMV disease in all settings. Uh, Dr. Goodrum is the recipient of the, uh, the Howard Temin Award for the National Cancer Institute, uh, the Pew Scholar in Biomedical Sciences Award, and Presidential Award for Early Career Scientists and Engineers. And uh, we are honored to have her with us today. Um, Dr. Felicia Goodrum, thank you so much for taking the time to come on the show. Thank you, Ira. This is a real pleasure and honor. It's it's great to have you. Um, I would love to start things off. I know we're going to be talking uh, a lot about CMV today, but you know, I would love to start things off uh, before that with adenovirus because I took a little peek <laughs> at your PhD uh, functions of the early region one beta fifty five kilodalt nonca protein of adenovirus in promoting cell cycle interdependent virus replication and mediating mRNA transport. Uh, <laughs> didn't read the whole thing, but uh, I, I I thought there was a fascinating theme here that ultimately, you know, translates to what you're doing in CMV today, where you're, you know, you're looking at this interesting sort of multifunctional protein that is involved in everything from uh, the lytic processes of this virus to its oncogenic transformation potential. Uh, really a neat little story about, you know, which we'll see over and over again about how these viruses really make us their puppets <laughs> in many different ways. <laughs> Talk a little bit about the early days, if you would, and, and sort of your initial sort of foray into uh, adenovirus research. Well, it's interesting. When I went to graduate school, I, you know, I'd graduated from Virginia Tech with a bachelor's in biology, and I had no idea what you do with that. Um, so I decided to go to graduate school, um, and there was only one thing on my list that I wasn't interested in studying. That I thought I was very open-minded for a 22-year-old, um, and that was viruses. <laughs> <laughs> However, um, I entered a lab that was studying, as you mentioned, how um, RNA gets transported from the nucleus to the cytoplasm. And they were using a virus as a model system because adenovirus could stop the transport of RNAs, cellular RNAs, to the cytoplasm while facilitating the transport of its own. And I'm like, wow, that's a cool trick. Um, and so within two weeks of being in that lab on my first rotation, I knew that this was the thing I wanted to do. Um, that viruses were absolutely the most amazing tools for understanding cell biology. Mm -hmm. And that remains to this day. 
Um, and so I had this great graduate um, school experience and, you know, I think, you know, did some really fun science and, you know, I still to this day tell my students about, you know, it really takes a special kind of student that can really embrace the complexity of the cell biology, the virology, but then there's this third thing of the cell and the virus together, which is completely different. Yeah. Um, as you say, the virus, you know, makes us our puppet. And I think that's a great uh, analogy that I have not ever heard before, but that's a cool way of thinking about it. So um, I think that's where I came to um, really love virology. And when I was looking and thinking about postdocs, my graduate mentor said, well, what do you, what about cytomegalovirus? Why don't you think about that? So I trotted off to the actual library and spent a couple of hours in the stacks um, and came back to the lab and said, CMV, that stuff is like horrible. They don't know anything. Because adenovirus, of course, is this incredibly elegant system that had been so well worked out. I never had to make a recombinant virus or a mutant virus in graduate school because they all existed. Um, and he said, right, exactly. And I was like, oh, yeah, <laughs> this is actually a gold mine of like really wonderful questions that have yet to be completely tapped into. And that's because CMV is just really this complex, complex virus, 236 kilobase genome, which is the yeah. largest virus we know of infecting humans. It encodes about 200 genes, um, but and maybe maybe very you know more, but we know that it gives rise to many more proteins um, than 200. And so it's been this incredibly complex and wonderful um, playground to understand this very special interface between the virus and the host. It's it is interesting because um, before you know set up the show with you, I had uh, you know local living legend here in the Philly area, Stan Plotkin, on the show. And when CMV came up, he was like, mm, that's been a tough one for, for us in the <laughs> vaccine world. Uh, and, you know, this got me thinking of you, um, you know, reading about you. Um, talk a little, Take us a little more into the CMV story. You mentioned uh, here's a virus that has a, a weirdly large amount of genes uh, in its genome. Uh, I enjoyed a, a recent uh, show you were on the um, this week in virology where you mm -hmm. talked about things like tropism that it's not you know it's not just found in you know our lungs like uh, uh, like the influenza or anything this thing that goes everywhere and this really wild it, you, sixty to ninety nine percent of the population uh, latently infected with it so yeah it's it's pretty much everywhere. Talk a little bit about this one and I also very much enjoyed you know when you were saying um, evolutionarily. This thing goes back to the invertebrate vertebrate translate transition. So been around a long time, sort of evolving, co-evolving with us uh, and, and many other species along the way. Yeah, it really, it really has. I mean, and that's why it's such a powerful tool is because it knows our biology essentially better than we do. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and, and it really is a pinnacle of virus host evolution and that this virus can persist within us with really the most awesome immune system um, on the planet um, that is so capable of ridding us of infectious diseases, but herpes viruses in general and CMV very specifically has this amazing ability to sort of persist. Um, and so when I entered Tom Shank's lab, I, you know, we spent a couple of weeks kind of talking about what I wanted to do as a postdoc. And he'd been trying to get for about five years or so, someone to study um, cytomegalovirus latency Mm -hmm. And this, this was just seen as a very daunting question um, because it just, the systems didn't exist to actually study latency in, in a very mature form. Um, and the viral genome is so big, we didn't really have the ability to manipulate it genetically with any efficiency. And so, and in fact, the first recombinant virus I made in the lab took about six months, um, but then um, Tom had been working on with other labs as well, um, getting a bacterial artificial clone of the virus that would allow us to do genetics and make recombinants or mutations fairly quickly because we could do that in bacteria. And so that was kind of coming on the scene. It was clear it was coming. And so it allowed us to have a genetic approach. And so I was, I just thought this was a fantastic question. Like, how does the virus do this? at the level of the individual infected cell when this virus infects so many different cells, such a diversity of cell types, that in some cells, it can establish this latent infection, sort of a dormant state. Um, and so I decided I, I wanted to tackle that. And 
left his office <laughs> and told some of my brand new lab mates that I was going to do this. And they told me I was ending my career. So <laughs> oh, <laughs> that, okay. that was not encouraging, no. but here I am today still doing it. So it, um, and I think, you know, I'm so pleased, you know, I'm so proud of the students and trainees that have come through my lab and the progress that we've made on this question um, that is just really exciting. And, you know, when it comes to, um, you know, the pathology of this uh, in terms of human CMV, you know, we're, uh, you know, we've talked about a range of uh, viruses on the show, everything, you know, so if we put some bad, you know, Ebola and, and, and Hanta and some really bad stuff over here, uh, over here, we have maybe some good viruses that, that benefit us. We talked a little about hepatitis G on an episode and stuff like that. Um no, this thing isn't going to kill us, <laughs> but in certain situations, uh, and you point out in the immunocompromise, there are you know, a lot of issues, especially early in life in terms of uh, birth defects and things of this nature. And then uh, another topic that we'll get into sort of second to that in terms of aging uh, later on in life, the ability to affect things like the vascular system, uh, frailty, immunosenescence. Um, talk a little bit about that because, you know, when CMV comes to mind, yeah, it, it has a scary name, but you know it, it, the the pathogenesis of it is unique. Let's say, uh, depending on who you know, our where we are in life and sort of our um, sort of health status. Let's say, right? Yeah. So yeah, you know, most people don't think of viruses as beneficial. They think of them as these you know evil disease causing entities. But there's no selective pressure for a virus to cause disease, mm -hmm. right? You don't want to kill your host. You don't need to make your host. I mean, some viruses, right. you know, it's part of their evolution advantage to cause coughing and sneezing and things like that. But, you know, CMV has sort of found this really sweet spot of just being able to persist within us um, and not cause any disease in, in healthy individuals. And so, of course, if the virus crosses the placenta and infects yeah. a developing um, fetus, that is a very dangerous situation because that, that fetus doesn't have a fully functioning immune system. And so the virus can really just rip through without constraints. And of course, later in life, um, there may be from having carried this virus your whole life. I mean, it's been shown that about 30% of your CD4 and CD8 T cells that really help keep this virus in check by the time you're 80, they're all, they're all specific, 30% are specific yeah. to CMV. So that's you know clearly over the course of our life, our immune systems are devoting a tremendous amount of energy to keeping this virus in check. But through most of our lives, we live with this virus quite happily unless, um, the vi unless we become immunocompromised in some way, um, a transplant that requires immunosuppression, um, really intensive chemotherapy regimens can re result in enough immunosuppression where you get CMV disease. HIV infection can give CMV disease. And so there's a lot of situations where CMV is, is really bad. And I think, you know, it remains to be seen um, what costs or benefits there are to sort of carrying this virus um, and how it may be changing our biology. But this virus is really, it knows our immune system so well that it can really constantly modulate that immune system to evade detection and elimination. Mm -hmm. And that has some benefit, that has some costs, I think, um, in, in how um, our immune system is constantly being shaped. I don't know of a virus that has the, the power and capability to shape our immune system um, as exquisitely as CMV does. And so it's really, it's just fascinating. Um, and constantly leaves me and my colleagues in wonder of how this virus has evolved to modulate our, you know, really tremendous ability to sort of detect and respond to viral infection. In um, in 2017, you uh, you had a couple papers. One was in uh, Giro Science and uh, this uh, recent advances in CMV tropism, latency, and diagnosis during aging. And this you were summing sort of up the this was the sixth uh, international workshop on CMV and immunosenescence. And then you published um, in Current Opinions in Immunology the known unknowns: How might persistent herpes herpes virome shape immunity and aging? And sort of you know this topic of of aging longevity is is been kind of hot on our show lately. Um, we'll, we'll get into sort of cancer in a little bit, but talk about some of the other things you're learning here because you really in the in the second paper you outline a lot about um, you know how these viral elements from the genome to the epigenome and and, and other methods 
impact the host. What are some of the things we're learning specifically um, as it pertains in aging? Because, you know, I, uh, I sort of the, the theme of herpes virus is, has come up a lot in sort of the, the dementia Alzheimer's space in recent years, sort of, you know, maybe there's some interesting immune beta amyloid connection there. What are some of the other things you're learning there, sort of a mechanistic perspective on on what's happening here, specifically on the aging front? Yeah, that, of course, it's not an area of, um, where I focus necessarily, but I certainly have collaborators that do, um, and I, I, we do, all of the work we do kind of impacts aging, but it's still a, an area where we really don't understand. So for a long time, it was this idea that the virus was causing inflation of, of T cells um, yeah. in response that were specific to the virus, and then those were going to senesce. Because that's what we see in, for example, hep C patients, right. um, that you get the senescence or exhaustion of the cells because they're constantly responding to the stimulus. And of course, that's not healthy. Um, and we have lots of controls that right. sort of keep that in check so that we don't have this exaggerated spot response that can lead to um, really bad inflammatory states. But that's not happening with CMV. We're not getting senescence um, or, mm. or exhaustion. And so that's been pretty well definitively shown right now. Um, a lot of those T cells are polyfunctional. I think it's still very much up for debate. Um, you know, what are the costs? What are the benefits there um, as we age? And I think, you know, CMV, there's, you know, one paper from Mark Davis's lab that showed that for people sort of in the younger demographic, um, having a CMV infection actually boosts boosted responses to secondary infection or influenza um, vaccination, but we don't know. You know, as the people age, it seems to not be a benefit. And why is that? What is the cause of that deterioration? Is it the chronic inflammation? Is mm -hmm. it the loss of sort of naive T cells? Um, this is all, I think, you know, really active areas of research where. I think the next um, decade will be very enlightening, but we have a long way to go. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, continuing, uh, you know, along that thought, because I, I know another major component of, of your work is is on the oncology uh, side of this. And you point out, um, you know, it's an interesting thing on your website about how, you know, viruses may be responsible for something like 10 to 20% of all cancers. And, you know, we we're in this, interesting precision oncology era but again the way you know it, these viruses whether they do something with these oncogenes or these tumor suppressors or these other retro elements or whatever again very complex biology going on at that level that you know is a little bit beyond the precision right, of, right. um talk a little about the oncology side of this because i think that again you know uh you know the I come out of the pharma industry, you know, the, the industry flows in certain directions based on how the industry flows. But again, here we have something that uh, is a little more complex than just that oncogene or that tumor suppressor. Say a few words about. Uh, yeah, it is more complex. So adenovirus um, is a is classified as a DNA tumor virus. It doesn't cause cancer in humans, but it's a classic DNA tumor virus that encodes oncoproteins that can disarm our major tumor suppressors like P53 and the retinoblastoma protein that control the growth of cells. Mm -hmm. And so that's how all the tumor causing viruses, um, they really, that's how they drive their cancers. Um, so human papillomavirus is a great example. I mean, literally uh, all cervical cancers are caused by human papillomavirus infection. Um, and that's why the vaccine is so great because it is essentially a vaccine that is protecting us against a cancer. Um, but, you know, viruses don't cause cancer as part of their natural replication. Right. Um, when cancers happen, it's really the result of something gone wrong. So, for example, with human papillomavirus, um, the virus has lost the, the part of the, its genome that can control sort of replication. So you're just left with these oncoproteins that are now driving uncontrolled cell proliferation. So CMV doesn't do that. Um, the herpes viruses are much more complex than the small DNA tumor viruses. Um, but some herpes viruses do cause cancer, like Epstein-Barr virus mm -hmm. that causes infectious mono. It also is a major cause of nasopharyngeal carcinomas and a number of other cancers. Kaposi sarcoma was discovered because it was causing these supposedly 
Kaposi sarcoma lesions in right. AIDS patients, and it causes cancers. So why doesn't CMV? Because it it does um, modulate um, p53 and the retinoblastoma protein. It 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 has the ability to change um, cell cycle, um, metabolism, all the things. And in fact, a CMV infected cell, metabolic changes in that cell look very similar to a cancer cell. And so we don't know. Um, CMV definitely has never been shown to cause a cancer, but it's it may be that the virus modulates cancers. The right. presence of this virus could create an inflammatory state or could help um, rep, you know, replication and proliferation of cells that are becoming cancerous. And that's something that I think we really don't understand very well yet. Along those lines, um, you know, the there, there is a sort of a, a small set of therapeutics here, you know, specifically given to the uh, immunocompromised things like gangcyclovir, uh, foscarnet. Um, what, because, you know, when you, when we hear the term latency, um, you know, I think uh, about some of the discussions I had about uh, HIV and latency and sort of that particular area of, of HIV strategy about, you know, we got a, the virus down to a certain level, but we still have these reservoirs somehow. What, what is the appropriate drug that we could potentially develop to not, you know, get this thing going full bloom, but activate to a certain level that we can then destroy those remaining reservoirs. What are some of the the therapeutic strategies? And we'll talk vaccines in a bit, but what are some of the therapeutic strategies that either you or your collaborators are, are thinking about in terms of what direction to go with something like this that is so prevalent and so latent <laughs> uh, <Right>. at the <laughs> same time? Yeah, so most of the antiviral therapies that we currently have are targeting some aspect of the viral machinery that it needs yeah. for replication, such as a DNA polymerase or viral kinase or something like that. Um, the problem with that is that in a, in a CMV reactivation where you're getting CMV disease, you're always playing catch up. The virus is already replicating and you're trying to tamp that back down. Um, those types of antivirals, they don't work on the latent reservoir. The latent reservoir is a state where the virus right. is quiet. It's not replicating. And so those drugs don't really have an effect. So even if we treat people with those drugs, you're still leaving behind this latent reservoir that other antivirals um, would, would well, and with other viruses, the antivirals are actually successful in clearing a virus infection because all the virus is replicating. With CMV, you always or going in a human host, there will always be cells that are not reactivating, um, even in someone who's immunosuppressed. And so you can't 100% get this cleansing um, of the virus. Mm -hmm. So, you know, my work is really to understand the basic mechanisms of how this virus is establishing this latent infection and what are the changes that are happening that allow the virus to reactivate. What is the virus sensing um, in our biology to know, okay, let's stay latent or let's reactivate. How's it filtering out the noise and making these decisions? And so hopefully where we would get to with those sorts of studies is identifying factors, either viral or cellular, that we could go after to either uh, prevent the latent infection um, tr or trigger a reactivation where then a, you know, a, a pure reactivation where everything's reactivated and then you could get this um, use your existing antivirals to target that. That's mm -hmm. often referred to as like a shock and kill strategy yep. or some drug that was going to keep it in a latent state that would you know, inhibit its ability um, to reactivate. And so those, you know, and one problem with the existing antivirals is that viruses are very good because they evolve more quickly than we do. Yep. Um, very good at developing um, antiviral um, or mutations that get antiviral resistance. And so that's always a problem, but if you had a cellular target that you could target either, either alone or in combination with a viral target, that would be a really strong, um, I think, path towards controlling the latent infection and reactivation from latency, which I think for herpes viruses would be an amazing place for the field to get to. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And um, as far as the uh, the vaccination side of things, I know, you know, again, Stan talked a little bit about, you know, 
the sort of the history there and you know there, there are candidates in development anything exciting there one way or another um i don't know if you talked to stan at all or, <laughs> about the vaccination side of things but um your, your thoughts just on, on cmv vaccination where you'd like to see that whole area of the, of the science go Yes, Dan and I have talked a lot about it and the difficulty of CMV. Um, I think that, you know, there's hope. Um, a lot of what's happening is shrouded, um, you know, behind the uh, pharma walls that I don't really have insights to what we're doing with CMV vaccines. I mean, the the idea is to get a vaccine that could, in particular, present, prevent um, the virus from crossing the placenta and causing the congenital infection. The problem is um, for women is that even though women have natural immunity to CMV from having CMV infections through their lifetime, the virus can still escape that immunity. So the, the key is like really understanding um, what would be a, a sterilizing type immunity or what's mm -hmm. gonna be protective immunity um, in the case of a reactivation. And that I think um, is something that is an exciting area of research where they're making rapid advances, but um, I'd be I'm I'm very eager to understand more about sort of the vaccine development. It's interesting that with CMV because of its very complex um, relationship with our immune system, and that the virus can continually reinfect us. Yeah. Um, it is as you know as promising of the work to get a candidate for CMV vaccine is the work to develop CMV as a vaccine vector for anything else, any other viral infection, um, for, for cancers in particular, and that we can engineer the virus to encode, say, um, an, a, a tumor antigen that would then allow our immune systems to see that. And because CMV can constantly um, reinfect us, that we could really um, immunize people against a lot of different things using CMV as vaccine vectors. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. That's a really, I think, really exciting area of, of research that will really change the way we think about vaccination. Absolutely. Absolutely. And a lot, um, I guess, uh, could just add a lot of a lot of the vaccine work with CMV now is is really based in these RNA um, vaccines that were used in the COVID pandemic. And in fact, sure. when the pandemic started, there there were uh, there was a lot of research being done on creating a vaccine for CMV that was an RNA vaccine. And, you know, what we saw with the COVID pandemic is how effective those vaccines are. And so that could be a real game changer in terms of CMV and if they're able to really shape a very strong immune response to CMV. So I'm anxious to see um, what is going to come out in that area. Absolutely. Yeah, definitely. You know, I one thing I, I neglected to mention uh, in, in the bio is, in addition to everything that you're involved in, um, you're also, uh, you know, connected with this this Aegis um, initiative at University of the Aegis Consortium, um, sort of looking broadly at uh, developing pandemic solutions. And and I, I guess you know, so the the initial focus here being obviously SARS-CoV-2, but there's themes in this Aegis program that clearly fall into your responsibility in terms of, you know, looking at multi-organ effects of viruses, post-virus uh, uh, interactions and, and the unique changes that occur in different uh, environments. Talk a little bit about what Aegis is all about, because I think it's a an important pillar. Obviously, you're you're heavy into CMV, but you look at more than more than that at the at the Institute. Yeah, I think Aegis comes out of, uh, you know, this this desire to sort of be in a better place to respond to future pandemics. Viruses are emerging like crazy. I mean, this is, you know, we've had, there's 10 viruses with pandemic or epidemic potential that have emerged in the past 100 years. And that is just increasing as we, um, you know, destroy habitats, encroach on habitats, increased urbanization, um, climate change, which is increasing the range at which um, vector-borne viruses are moving into. And if this is a problem. We're gonna see more and more viruses emerge. We have to be prepared for that. And we need to be able to respond better. I mean, you know, on the one hand, our response to SARS-CoV-2 and the COVID-19 pandemic was astounding. In a year's time, we had vaccines, antivirals, rapid tests, and had really improved our ability to treat that virus. 
Um, and that all came from decades and decades of work studying the SARS-1 and MERS viruses. And so right. that kind of research is, it's slow going, but it's foundational. Yeah. Um, and then, and, and so a lot of play, a lot of universities and, and other entities really wanted to make sure that we were thinking about this proactively and preparing for pandemics in the future. And that requires the integration of a number of disciplines. So my area is sort of the infectious disease and the biology of infection, um, which, which is an obvious place where you have to work to prepare for pandemics. But then what about things like the built environment? Yep. What about things like um, communication to the public about public health? You know, that there's a public health component. There's all these things that really have to come together if we're going to have more effective response to pandemic. And so Aegis and other initiatives like it are trying to bring together sort of all those different pillars um, and, and, and to basically, it, you know, it's this more one health type consideration yeah. where you bring together a lot of people from a lot of different areas that work together then to be able to respond to that. You know, to, to technology, how do we integrate technology like worn um, Fitbits and things or worn devices or, or pathogen sensing devices that can yeah. monitor this sort of stuff, um, which is a, you know, an aspect of technology that, that, is I think rapidly moving into this area to very good effect. And so, um, you know, Johns Hopkins, for example, has had a very strong sort of group of scientists that have really been working proactively in this area. But now I think the rest of us are trying to develop similar things. And as we sort of start blanketing the country and blanketing the world with these initiatives, I think that's where we really come to, to be in a powerful place to confront the challenges that viruses are going to continue to um, to present to humanity. Yeah, and, and along those, I'm glad you brought up the One Health because I, you know, I I quickly, as again mentioned in your bio, that you know one of your professorships is this Bio Five Institute, which clearly you know talks about the the plant animal human intersection there and sort of the the importance of uh, not just doing that One Health research but engaging errors with. Arizona focus, but then engaging students to you know, understand that, you know, uh, yes, you might study plant biology, but there is a, again, one health. Say, just say a few words about bi uh, Bio5, if you would. Yeah, so Bio5 is a multidisciplinary institution. Um, you know, when I was leaving my postdoc and it was in this dip where there weren't a lot of jobs available. Mm -hmm. I sent out very few applications. Um, the University of Arizona was not um, an obvious fit because they didn't have a lot of virology here at all. Um, and, you know, it wasn't sort of, you know, science, having grown up on the East Coast, I mean, you know, the strong corridor for science that I was in, it wasn't an obvious choice. But this institute was built on multidisciplinary collaboration where you get cross fertilization of ideas. And so there are labs here that work on maize genetics, mm -hmm. um, things that are very disparate from the kind of things I do. But the cross fertilization actually can really help forge very rich um, new areas in science. And so that was very attractive to me. The other thing that Bio5 was doing very actively at that time was sort of teacher training where a lot of scientific outreach was about scientists going into so you know into high schools or doing plating bacteria experiments you know with with kindergarten kids or whatever um but bio5 took a different approach they brought during the summer all the teachers in mm -hmm. middle school high school even elementary school teachers and taught the teachers how to teach science and about what mm. scientific research was and how is it done so that then they took that into their classrooms and then they're teaching, you know, a large classroom of kids up to, you know, in high school, hundreds of kids a year. And so I think that is so important in a place where, you know, if there's one thing that I could change um, in the U.S. is really our science education of the lay public um, and the ability for people to think critically and to really understand how science is done and its importance. And, and this is, I think, a huge initiative that Bio5 has been really you know, transformative in, and, and that was very attractive. Um, and so that's, that's why I came, and that's why I've stayed. And 
Um, you know, it's really important to be able to approach science by integrating many disciplines. And so I have collaborators that have never touched or thought about a virus, collaborators mm -hmm. in protein cell trafficking um, and signaling, collaborators in DNA damage and recombination. And they do their work in Drosophila um, mm -hmm. or, you know, dog cells or you know, all kinds of different things that, um, you know, bringing this together though to the virology um, is just really, a, it's a fun way to do science and a very productive way to do science. Outstanding. Um, Alicia, one of the, um, you know, as we, as we were mentioning sort of the, the sliding scale of, uh, you know, the, I don't know, let's say the scariness uh, of certain viruses uh, versus others. You know, I mentioned uh, we spent a little time talking about the, the, this hepatitis G uh, on on, a, on some past shows about how, you know, it confers certain resi human resilience to some other viruses. We did a show on, uh, on bacteriophage. Um, any, you know, along along the way, as you're, you know, uh, involved in, in, in these various areas that touch the, the virome overall, any other interesting projects, collaborations in terms of the beneficial application of specific viruses or the human virome in general? Yeah, the virome is so interesting and, and something that's a lot more complicated to get at because, you know, viruses, there's such diversity in viruses. We don't have a 16S RNA, um, you know, that, that's been so useful with um, identifying, you know, understanding the, the microbiome. Um, I think it's a really important area. It's not anything, any place that we're doing any work specifically, but the possible interactions between a virus like CMV with right. other viruses is going to be something that's critical to understand. Yeah. You know, these infections from multiple pathogens, whether it's two viruses or bacteria and a virus and how they're going to affect each other is I think a critical area. Um, it's a difficult area, but there are people moving into that. Um, and it's a really important place for some really interesting work. Yeah, but I'm always sort of intrigued and obviously not being a virologist or anything, but, you know, when you see some of uh, specifically on the uh, the immune system front about how, you know, infection with X virus can maybe via some unique epigenetic mechanisms make you more resilient. And, and um, I just think that's, uh, again, looking forward in terms yes. of virology, um, just really... Well, uh, Please. Also, how these viruses and co-infections oh, impact yeah. chronic diseases, so not necessarily a benefit. Um, you know, there are a lot of diseases, sort of chronic inflammatory diseases with no ideology, and viruses are a prime candidate, um, especially some of these viruses that fly under the radar, like CMV, that are sort of hard to sort of diagnose as the culprit of something. And then a co-infection with CMV, I think will be very important in sort of making inroads to understanding chronic diseases or diseases like Alzheimer's that show up years and years after some effect. Cancers, for example, um, cancer is essentially a chronic disease that usually shows up years and years after the you know initiating mutation or the initiating infection. Yep. Um. Virology Under the Microscope, A Call for Rational Discourse, uh, a paper that you uh, published with, I think, numbers of something like 156, uh, 156 other virologists. 156 total authors. Okay, so 156 total <laughs> authors. You were, the, you were author number one on it. So um, I'm not sure I'll ever do that again. <laughs> no, but it's, it's, it's pretty cool. But, you know, you know you're pointing out um, in this paper, look, we've had... We've had a lot of good successes. Virology research has done so much for us uh, over the last many decades, but we've got a lot of public confusion out there. Uh, and, you know, we, we are at a weird time right now where oddly, you know, uh, virologists are getting lumped into sort of this category of, you know, doing a bunch of scary things. Um, I've tried on this show, you know, with some of the guests uh, like uh, Andrew Hebler at the White House Office of Science and Technology to talk about gain of function, talk about the ban, talk about the lifting of the ban, uh, talk about, you know, like Stan, Stan talked about uh, challenge studies that, you know, that there's a place for this. Um, 
talk about why you wrote this paper, uh, a little bit of, you know, how you got everybody together. And, you know, I think it's just an extremely important part of where we are nowadays in, um, you know, this anti-science stuff that's happening all around us. But please talk a little about this one. Yeah, well, this actually started really pre-pandemic and that I did this, um, I applied to and received support from the university to do this public voices fellowship. And it's it's really an initiative led by the Op-Ed Project, which I just cannot shout out enough to, to try to get voices of women and other underrepresented um, people into the space of writing opinions. Um, and I, it's a year long program and I participated in it and learned how to write op-eds, wrote a few op-eds, published some op-eds on climate change and viruses and um, education, all mm -hmm. kinds of things. Um, that where you know women and underrepresented people only typically hold about 25% of the space of op-eds published. So that was really to increase that. And that was back in 2017 or 2018. And then the you know the pandemic came years later. Um, and then late February, early March, I just, you know, I knew this was coming, it was clear. Um, and I thought, wow, I, I should write about this for the public. And um and started doing that. We wrote like you know thirty different um, op eds. As as time went on, um, through my work with the American Society for Virology, and as co editor in chief of the Journal of Virology, there was this increased responsibility to sort of advocate for virology. Yep. Um, and so it was this perfect storm, I think, of these sort of three experiences coming together. Um, and, and and so now I. I've, recently assumed back in um, July of 2022, the position of co-editor in chief of the journal virology. And so um, when this sort of the fervor of, of this anti-science rhetoric um, started to heighten and the attack on virology, um, the call for increased oversight of virology, and really the conflation of um, worries about where viruses emerge from and gain of function. Um, and, you know, where that happened, it was like, wow, we, we really need to do something. And so the the person that I had started writing op-eds with way back at the beginning of the pandemic is Jim Allwine. He was a professor at the University of Pennsylvania, but um, he had retired to Tucson and was coming to my lab meetings every week, which has been amazing. And so when the pandemic started, I said to him, you know, we, I have to write about this, but I'm not going to have time. I also have to lead, help lead my department through this stuff in my lab. Um, but it would help if I had a writing partner. And so he and I started writing together. It was a fantastic collaboration. And we continued. And so he and I had been working on this piece, Virology Under the Microscope, sort of about the problem with this anti-science movement. And he... Um, you know, we've been exchanging drafts and I said, well, you know, what about if we bring some more people into this? And because this, you know, strength in numbers and numbers and sure. to really like try to come up with a consensus statement that the whole field could get behind. And so this just grew. It started over Christmas um, 2022 and we spent really a solid month working on this um, and grew organically to a lot of 156 people wanting to join on. Some very powerful voices in there. This mm -hmm. is a very broad swath of virology. Most of us do not work on coronaviruses, but really sure. felt like we needed to stand up. And so that was, can't even tell you the wrangling of 156 <laughs> opinions <laughs> with very opinionated people that scientists are. Um, but it was such a tremendous experience to see the field come around this together and really um, us to be able to come to a consistent consensus and put out a statement that I think has been very powerful. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, and I, that's I what I love about science and this community of scientists is just phenomenal. Yeah. And, and I think, you know, it's, um, it, it's interesting because, you know, uh, the, the another program that I've I profiled several guests actually this um, you know there's this bipartisan um, commission on biodefense now in D.C. Senator Joe Lieberman, uh, Dr. Donna Shalala, Peggy Hamburg, former FDA commissioner. Um, a lot of people you know are hearing you know they they understand what you're saying and you and 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 Virals are saying that we need a lot uh, we need a lot 
for all parts of this virology problem, for the pandemic problem. I mean, they want uh, 10 billion a year for 10 years, $100 billion, it's a nice number. You know, it's, uh, <laughs> we spend a lot of money on other things. So there's, yes. you know, in, in the corridors of power, there's there's people thinking about this as well. Um, you know, I just like, you know, thinking to the future, I mean, what what would you like to see, you know, 10, 100 billion, what would you like to see, um, you know, the future of sort of, pandemic prevention slash virology look like if we could, you know, take a little journey into the future and I gave you that hundred billion dollars or whatever to, <laughs> to play around with, but you know, any sort of uh, dreams that you have in terms of what, uh, where this all could go. Um, so many, <laughs> <laughs> I think, you know, one thing that just besides the science, but that I've already touched on is just the importance that we really increase public literacy around science. Yeah. Um, that's the place where a lot of effort and energy needs to go to what is public health. Can you imagine when this pandemic hit, if we had a public that was pretty literate and just yeah. basic you know, safeguards against respiratory viruses, um, knowing how these things spread and knowing how the disease is caused and, and what we need to do to protect ourselves um, and, and the importance of vaccines and the safety of vaccines. Mm -hmm. And then on the science side, we really need to increase our understanding. I and mean, this is where really all those different pillars come in of multidisciplinary research, where we need to increase our understanding of the viruses that are out there, how yep. they're transmitting amongst animals, and how they can move into humans. That's sort of the surveillance. It's been called you know, virus surveilling yep. of what are all the different viruses out there that are moving between bats or birds um, and that how are primed to enter the human population. That is one of the most important places we can work, but that also brings in climate change because it's really climate change and habitat destruction and urbanization that's driving that. You know, for example, with, with SARS-CoV-2, um, the best data we have is about the zoonotic origin of this virus being able to jump from animals into humans mm -hmm. and then acquire the ability to spread human to human. Um, you know, having markets where live wild animals are interfacing with humans is a perfect storm for something like that to happen. Uh, a lot of cultures have people going into caves and, and doing things where they're doing a lot of work um, and potentially exposed to bat viruses. So this is a high risk, perfect storm of high population density um, and interfacing with wild animals that we really need to understand and put a lot of focus in understanding how these viruses jump, how they mutate, how they evolve to spread. Um, and then of course, it's only through this work that we could ever develop vaccines or antivirals. We have mm -hmm. to know what we're targeting. And so that's where I would really focus a lot of um, the, the efforts and resources. However, there's you cannot say enough about the importance of basic virology, the, the work that every single virologist is doing to understand how do viruses enter cells? What are the receptors that are needed? What are the, the different things that confer tropism to what cells are being infected? Um, how, and then once those cells are infected, how is the virus replicating? Um, you know, in order for a virus to replicate in a cell, you think the virus just gets in and does its thing? No, it requires hundreds, if not thousands of cellular factors. In the case of CMV, there's not a, a human pathway, a cellular pathway that this virus does not tweak. And mm. so it's very complex biology that needs a lot of, um, a lot of attention for us to really understand viral diseases and viral spread. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I just, I throw one thing on there because I, uh, um, a, a couple of weeks ago, I had um, uh, Dr. Tim Wittig on the show, and he used to be a defense intelligence uh, agency analyst. Now he, was, you know, he works with the uh, uh, the Royal Foundation of uh, uh, of Prince uh, Harry now. But you know, the, the number uh, I, I never realized until he was telling me the the number behind. Uh, the pangolins and the rhinoceros horns and the, and the, and the monkey. I mean, it's it's hundred it's over hundred billion dollars. I mean, it's a crazy number. And I know you know a lot of times sort of that the zoonotic stuff gets poo pooed, but there's a, there's a reason, strange reason that we don't think about you know why that is so prevalent. And uh, it's important to get that under control. Um, yes, <laughs> it's uh, it's a business that uh, exists. So, you know, whether it's legal or illegal or wherever it falls, it's a uh, yeah, it's a bad thing. And and we need to we need to think about sort of the the financial uh, component uh, 
that sits behind it all. But anyway, that's a different topic for another story. Um, Felicia, wh while we have you, um, what else? Uh, I know we're coming up against a hard stop in about 13 minutes, but what um, what else is hot for 2023? Uh, any conferences that you're going to be going to, uh, talks you're going to be giving, places that uh, we can uh, listen to you, meet you possibly, anything else uh, in the coming months, please? Take the floor. Oh, interesting. Well, I will be going to the American Society of Virology meeting, which is going to be in Athens, Georgia. Okay. I will also be going to the International Herpes Virus Workshop, which is going to be in Montana. Um, we'll also be going, there's a Gordon conference on viruses and cells, which is an amazing conference. It brings together people across all viruses, similar to the American Society for Virology. So that's where you get a lot of interface with people studying all kinds of different viral systems. Mm -hmm. um, and that's gonna, the, the Gordon Conference um, will be in Barcelona, Spain in May. And so um, I will be there. Um, but yeah, I don't, I may be going to a WHO meeting in Geneva mm -hmm. um, that would be really sort of addressing some of these issues um, and looking broadly at all kinds of viruses that we need to be worried about with respect to their impacts on human health or their the, the, the threats that they may pose. Excellent. Excellent. Well, they need to have you there, <laughs> uh, to, you know, to, uh, saying these messages, telling these stories, because it's just, you know, it's such an important time and we've got to keep, uh, We've got to, we've got to keep the literacy uh, out there for for not just the scientific community but for, for the, the general public. But no, I I um I applaud you, Felicia. I, I I'm really just you know so excited about uh, the work you do that you continue to do and just oh, uh, wishing you. you the best with all of it. Um, again for uh everybody that's going to be listening to this particular episode of our show uh, across the various podcast networks or uh, watching on the youtube channel again you've been listening to dr felicia goodrum interim associate direct department head professor and director of graduate programs in immunobiology as well as professor bio five institute yeah. professor cellular molecular medicine molecular and cellular biology and cancer biology and genetics graduate interdisciplinary interdisciplinary programs university of arizona also check out the uh, the Aegis Consortium. Um, Felicia, again, I want to thank you for taking the time out of your schedule to come talk and educate us for a little while on these topics. Obviously, thank you for doing what you do. And as we like to say on our show here, uh, thanks for helping to create a better tomorrow via the work you do. Um, oh, really, thank really you. Story. It was a real pleasure to talk to you, Ira. Great having you.